Hey, good afternoon. This is Richard Shu, host of Shu Untied. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to have with me as my guest, Dan Calloway, who's a partner at Ferella Braun and Martell. Dan, welcome to the program. Hi, Richard. Thank you for having me. So, Dan, one of the things that leapt off your uh, LinkedIn page uh, is that you went to college to study to become an electrical engineer. You even got a master's degree. So tell me a little bit about uh, what were your plans there? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Ever since I was a young boy, I kept asking my parents that question, how does it work? You know, uh, how does an airplane fly? Why do the brakes on that truck make that hissing noise? Mm. How come the telephone still works when the power goes out, right? Mm. And my parents um, were very patient in answering those questions. They still are. Um, and now my son, who's 10, and my daughter, who's seven, ask me those questions. So I know <laughs> just how patient my, my parents were. Um, but I kind of had this like itch, you know, from from a very young age of wanting to understand how things worked, being fascinated with what went into making things work. And that always, it kind of manifested itself in electrical things more so. It was mechanical things, too. But, you know, it was kind of in my bones from an early age. Mm -hmm. And as I approached um, college age, um, I became I, I was it was pretty clear to me that I was interested in that I was also interested in in other things creative writing and science uh, pure science but that question of how does it work was very much in my mind as I was applying to colleges yeah I imagine so what kind of what kind of engineering did you study in college um and then obviously you got a master's degree but I'm curious to know what you know what area of engineering you studied yeah so I studied electrical engineering I went mm -hmm. to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore Mm -hmm. um, and I was lucky enough when I when I got there to meet some incredibly smart people uh, in my in my cohort of uh, of students, and so I took I took courses in signal processing and chip design, um, more abstract uh, courses in algorithms. Mm -hmm. Hopkins really had a, a broad range of classes, um, and they didn't at the time there wasn't a, a super specialty in chip design. Uh, some schools have now. So a lot of it was very theoretical, but other aspects of it were very much about designing the kind of chips uh, that I went on to work with late, you know, in my engineering career. Did you do any kind of master's thesis or anything for your master's degree? I didn't actually. Hopkins had an option where you could either um, do a thesis or you could take like four extra classes. Mm. And for whatever reason, you know, part of it was I applied to the bachelor's master's program when I was uh late in my junior year hopkins mm -hmm. had this option where you could um, apply for the five-year masters while you were completing your bachelor's um and i i got in and and part of the part of the question was okay how do you map out your remaining couple of years to to satisfy all these requirements and i had courses i wanted to i, I wanted to take and was working with my advisor um on, on mapping that out so i wound up just taking the extra courses got it did you do much programming did you do any computer programming i did i did yeah i had uh, a good friend named seth who nudged me to not only take the the engineering classes but to kind of dabble in the computer science side of things mm -hmm. which was very, which was fine with with mm -hmm. the school mm -hmm. um, and paid dividends later for me because programming it's a really important tool in being able to build models of things build software to run hardware and, you know, kind of be able to create a robust prototype of something that you want to build. What kind of computer languages did you program in college? At the time, C and C++ were the norm. Java uh -huh. was was coming, you know, coming to the fore at the time. So I studied that a little bit. Yeah. And part of the discipline of learning about um, how computers work is learning about assembly language and machine language. Of course. So, I, I programmed less in those languages because it's very time consuming to do that. Yep. But for sure, I learned about those and found it fascinating because, you you know, when you look at machine language, you're looking not just at the abstract language that describes algorithms, but you're actually looking at the signals that go into the processor to make it do what it does. Yep. I'm a generation in behind or in front of you, but I had to program a, an Intel 8080 chip. So uh, quite familiar with chasing down zeros and ones. Yes. Um, <laughs> did you take Did you take one of the classes that I thought was very hard? Was analog circuit design? Is that one you took? I did. Yeah, I took several courses in analog circuit design. Mm -hmm. A wonderful professor named Andreas Andreu uh, mm -hmm. at Hopkins who taught this course and really challenged students to um, push their understanding of uh, of that field. And he also taught 
the um, the design lab where you would learn how to fabricate integrated circuits. Yeah. He was fascinated at the time with with MEMS or microelectro machined uh, surfaces, where yeah. you could not not only create cir uh, circuits on a silicon substrate, but create machinery. Yeah. Uh, and at the time, that was a pretty that was a pretty exciting and is today a very exciting field. For so sure. I got to take sure. not only his course in in analog circuit design, but then the class in or the lab in in designing uh, structures and and making chips. That's very cool. Well, I know you I know you obviously ended up going to work as an engineer, but before we get to that, did you ever consider doing a PhD? Was that on the table at all? Did you toy with that idea ever? You know, I I didn't. I, I really owe it to the the same friends that I alluded to earlier who nudged me into uh you know going to the master's program, my friend Seth, my friend Jay, uh, who showed me how practical and easy it was to apply for this this bachelor's master's program. Mm. But my my uh, mother is a professor of theology, actually. So I grew up close to academia mm. and um, very much appreciating it. And I did appreciate, you know, what I learned at Hopkins and being in that setting. But at the time, I think I was very conscious of wanting to get out there and, you know, be an engineer and, and be out there in the real world. Yeah. So that five year bachelor's master's program for me was the right speed because it was just one more year to get the master's. Um, and, and I wasn't particularly interested in, in you know, going the depths for, for the PhD. Yeah, okay. Well, tell me about your first job. You, it looks like you were a semiconductor engineer. Tell me about that first job and what did you do? I was, my, my first job is, is a, a little bit of a short story because I worked in briefly in New Jersey after graduating. But um, my friend Seth called me from, the, from his dorm at Stanford uh, where he was, where he was he, he got his master's in electrical engineering there. And he said, I just got hired by this amazing company called Volterra. They're early stage, mm. pre-IPO, very exciting company. You've got to come check them out. Mm. And, you know, I was making really good friends in New Jersey. I was kind of starting my professional life, but um, I had learned so much from this friend when I was in college and, and you know, trusted his instincts. It had kind of the ring of destiny to it. To, to, to have someone say, you should come check out this company in California. Um, and of course, that there's that magnetic pull of California to kids who grew up on the East Coast, at least there was for me. Um, and so I came out, I interviewed. Volterra really was an incredibly exciting company. It, it was the passion project of five, I believe, PhD students in electrical engineering at Berkeley uh -huh. who partnered together with one MBA student and had this concept that they won an internal design competition with that sort of through an incubator became their new company, Volterra. And it was backed by Kleiner Perkins. It was when I interviewed there, they were still in stealth mode. Wow. Uh, but they had an incredibly exciting technology, which I, which I could bore you with. Um, but well, give, me, give me a feel for it. I'm, 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 I'm waiting with bated breath if you hear about this technology. Sure. At that time, every, every, uh, iteration of Intel's technology that would come out, every every new um, layer of microprocessors that would come out would require more and more current um, mm -hmm. at a more highly regulated voltage. So okay. very, very tightly controlled voltage regulation at super, super high currents, you know, to over 100 amps. Okay. So it's very difficult to regulate power to that extent. And they, had, they were um, part of kind of a new class of companies that were creating these integrated voltage regulators that were basically themselves computers that would actively regulate power using several chips and a, and a bunch of other components. Yeah, interesting. So there's a very complicated solution to what seems like a very simple problem, which is providing power. Usually, right. you know, providing power, you just kind of plug something in, but to, to achieve the precision that was necessary, um, they had a, an incredibly innovative technology that hit on a lot of points. It was circuit design. <clears throat> it was algorithms that made the power regulation work. Hmm. Um, and operationally, Volterra was a fabulous semiconductor company. Hmm. So they did, they didn't have their own micro, you know, microprocessing, uh, they didn't have their own fabrication yeah. facilities. So they were, um, they were using uh, a company that has since become much better known, which is Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, which made many of the uh, wafers that went into Volterra's chips. Anyway, so the company was, was oh. operating over with overseas uh, vendors for manufacturing, for testing and and uh, finalization and all those things, and that's the you know the the realm that I operated in as a test engineer. Hmm. 
So how and so how how early the startup was this? Like how many people were at the company when you joined the company? Oh gosh, I think it was probably 60 or 70 people were there when I arrived. Mm -hmm. Maybe less than that. And then it probably grew to, to 2x that size hmm. by the time of the IPO in 2004. Yeah, yeah. Well, what did you do while you were there? You were there for a while. Yeah, I was there for about 5 years and like I said, I I worked in um the the manufacturing aspect of specifically testing chips for for quality assurance after they were made. Mm. So at volume you have to be testing, you know, hundreds and thousands of these chips per hour and yeah. you have to create hardware and software that can do that really efficiently but also mm. really accurately. Mm. So you have, you know, the, the rule of thumb was like you have less than 1 second uh, of of hardware time to test each chip and you have to be able to Whoa. Just position each chip as good or bad as you go. Mm. Uh, and then a lot of interesting questions come up. So there are these, there were these really big foundational questions that Volterra had of what do the chips do? How do they regulate this power? How do we how do we make them efficiently? But then there are all these manufacturing questions of okay, how do we get the signals in and out of the chip? And how do we guarantee that every chip falls in its performance within this proper window? Yeah. Right? Um, and so there were just so many different engineering mm. problems that came up and Volterra got patents on many of those problems. Mm. And so one mm. of the early uh, exposures that I had to the patent process was one of the founders named Dave Litsky um, was was intimately involved with the patent process on behalf of the company and its um, and its inventors. And I got to talk to him and see up close mm. what an important part of the company's legacy they were. And, and you know, of course, that turned out to be a big part of my own future uh, yeah uh, yeah 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 well, well so 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 is that how, that's how it happened that that's what drew you into the legal side you you were not planning i'm assuming that was not the career path you were thinking when you joined the company or and then this it, happened that's part of it that's part of it for sure i also had a um i also had a, a very uh small nights and weekends passion project that i was working on that was a tool for musical conductors. I had been involved in music and electronic music, um, including while I was at Johns Hopkins, I was lucky enough to go to their Peabody Institute, which is a very well-renowned musical conservatory that Johns Hopkins uh, partnered with in the 80s. And uh, lowly engineering students like myself could cross register and take intro to music theory with trombone students and singers and clarinetists and all of that. So I, I had this exposure to to music while I was in college and before I played the guitar, but I had this little you know project of of a system that would let someone load up some music on a computer, particularly a classical piece of music, mm -hmm. and then I had some sensors that would let the person conduct the music in real time and have the computer play it back, right? So mm -hmm. if the person stopped, the music would stop. If they oh, went faster, oh. it would go faster. So clearly, it was going to take over the world. This thing was you know everybody was going <laughs> to buy one, right? So anyway, I had some friends who were who were musical conductors who were really, really, you know, esteemed in this field. And I was lucky enough to show it to to one of my friends. And he said, this is pretty cool. But have you talked to a patent attorney? And I said, oh, no. What, what do you mean? He said, you should talk to a patent attorney. So I did. Again, I'm not sure it was I'm not sure it was justified given, you know, the scope of uh, of this project. But um, it would have been pretty expensive, 10,000, 12,000 to go and, and get the thing patented. Right. So on, on the advice of uh, the gentleman before, I mentioned before, Dave Litsky at Volterra, um, I went and got this book, David Pressman, Patent It Yourself, oh, which yeah. walks you through how to write a patent application. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have a so I, I, I you know, took a look at the book, I wrote up my, my invention, and I submitted the patent application. And in the course of doing that, I think I, I got more and more interested in, oh, this is something this is something I could do. This is something that that mm -hmm. is consistent with uh, the, the questions that I've always asked. How does it work? Why does it work? The patent mm -hmm. was all about invention. So it kind of answered that question. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I found the whole process very, very interesting. I had been considering business school as an option, you know, to be a manager. Um, but this this was kind of a, mm -hmm. you know, as you suggested, a different direction, a different tack. That I found hmm. really fascinating. Interesting. So that and and that's what propelled you into then going to law school, basically. That that was, as I said, that was part of it. It was kind of like this combination of seeing how core 
um, patents and innovation were to, yeah. to a semiconductor company and understanding the kind of the linkage between um, investors and executives and engineers and what a key part of that patents were. And a patent is this really distilled um, you know, embodiment of, of an invention and, and teaching how to do it, which was consistent with all the things that it that had been so interesting to me in engineering school beforehand, afterward, you know, throughout. Yeah, totally. So then what, did you then just jump right into law school or did you do something else to kind of sort this out or what happened next? Well, I, I worked at Volterra for um, for about five years. Volterra had the IPO and it, mm -hmm. it, gave me, um, it gave me, you know, at least part of the money that I needed to pay my law school tuition. So that was a nice stair step. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I and then I graduated from law school in 2008 um, and, and went off and began practicing as, a, as a, an attorney. What did you think about law school when you started? Because it's so, you know, I was an engineer also, so I know it was very different than anything I'd ever done. What was your reaction? What did you think about it? Yeah, I... I thought it was fascinating. It was, um, yeah, I mean, I can only see it through my own eyes. Yeah, uh, yeah. At least that, that's how I saw it. So I, um, it was it was gratifying and and great to be back in that rich experience of, of learning, of, of, you know, reading, of, of exploring a whole new thing. And I, I think that was for me, a very rewarding part of law school because I'd been out working, I'd been, so focused on engineering for five years. Now I was reading about constitutional law <laughs> and contracts and torts and all this stuff that I, I really did find fascinating and it was completely new to me. You know, I wasn't pre-law, I hadn't planned it. Yeah. Uh, so it, it kind of came sideways and was like a, a pretty rich and satisfying experience. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to sit here and characterize law school through and through <laughs> as this intellectual buffet that's nothing but interesting. It can, it can be a grind. Um, <laughs> But uh, ultimately, I did like it. Yeah, interesting. Well, you obviously went into with the intent of becoming an intellectual property lawyer, but did you also try other types of law to make sure you didn't like that or to see if you like something else better? Yeah, I, I did. I, I tried not to take all the elective courses in IP and patents and, you know, super specific. I, yeah. I kind of thought this is a seismic shift in my career. And I really want to treat it with the respect it deserves and take law school as its own thing. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I have, you know, my my credentials and my background and my interests that I can make a strong prediction about where I'll wind up. Yeah. But yeah. I, I wanted to, you know, experience all of what what law school had to offer. And I, I wasn't terribly motivated to over specialize. Yeah. In law yeah. School. And, and I'm, yeah. I'm glad that I'm glad that I did that because criminal procedure as I mentioned, constitutional law, um, some of the some of the higher level um, uh, seminar courses in constitutional theory that I took at Hastings were completely fascinating to me and, and mm. remain so. Mm. Well, you've obviously had a very successful IP career now as an IP lawyer. Tell me a little bit about how that you know how did that progress and how did you get you know how do you get to where you are today? Yeah, so I I um, have always enjoyed uh, first and foremost the part of a patent case or a technology case, trade secret case, where I'm talking to the engineers about how the technology works. You know, mm -hmm. there's some issue in the case that we've got to we've got to resolve, and it all starts with talking to people who created the technology that's at issue, whether that's what they patented or whether that's what they're accused of in, of infringing or somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. um, it's just this interesting dialogue that I get to have with the people who are in the trenches, people who are actually doing this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I, I cherish the the opportunity to talk to them so directly about what they're doing, you know, to get them ready for depositions, get them ready for trial um, and, you know, share in some ways. It's nostalgic for me to work with people who are doing engineering sure. the way I used to do. Yeah. But then there's this additional challenge to it that's all about taking the, the engineering realities, taking the technology that um, in many ways is, is more kind of intuitive to the engineers and, and putting it into language that a court or a jury can take to actually try to resolve the issue. And it's this like, you know, constant problem in patent law and, and in frankly, in engineers communicating what they do directly, which is taking those concepts and making them understandable and expressing them. That's like its own puzzle unto itself. 
to use an engineering term that I think you'll appreciate when I when I did that as a living myself, I used to call it like impedance matching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got this one signal. You're, you're, you're that's one signal's like this, and you got to take it down. The, the other one's up here. This you exactly, the balance. Whatever. Yeah. You got to, you know, that's it was like impedance matching. I mean, that's what it always felt like, you know. But but tell me, so when did you make, because at some point I see that you switched over from being patent prosecution to litigation. And what, tell me a little about when, how did, you know, what made you decide you wanted to become more of a litigator than a prosecutor? Obviously, a lot of engineers become patent prosecution, um, uh, patent prosecutors. I think in those, the days when I was an engineer, when I decided to go to law school, the only concept I had was being a patent prosecutor, someone who applied for patents. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I When I was a summer associate and when I was starting out as a lawyer, um, I saw firsthand the difference between, okay, these are the folks who are doing patent prosecution. These are the folks who are doing litigation. And I think when I was there and I had some, some wonderful mentors in, in Howard Bollock and Michael Adley, um, who sort of showed me and, and were patient in teaching me about what it means to be a litigator yeah. um, and, and to take the engineering skills and skills and bring them into that realm. And I, at that point, it was pretty clear to me that the um, strategy and, as I said, the communication aspect of litigation um, was more appealing to me than than writing patent applications. Yeah. Although you did that for a while, right? It sounds like you, you did write patent applications for a while. I I did a, a tiny bit of it um, early in my career. Now, more recently, I've done um, inter partes reviews and challenges at the patent office. Right. So I, I became uh, a registered attorney at the patent office in I think 2015 okay. uh, for the sake of doing these uh, inter-party yeah, reviews. Yeah. Do you think your clients appreciate the fact that you're an engineer when you're talking to them? Like, do you feel like they sense that, you know, you kind of speak their lingo or you can relate to them better? What is your, what is your feeling about that? I, I, I'm sure, I think they know it right away. I, I think they, <laughs> you know, I, by, I, by, the, by the kinds of questions you ask and the way you ask them, maybe. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's uh, less flattering aspects of my personality, but I, I call myself a recovering engineer because if, you know I, I never I've never switched it off. If yeah. uh, yeah. Well. if the car is making a funny noise, my inclination is to open up the hood and monkey around with it, and it takes discipline to say no, no, no. I'm going to bring it to the mechanic. I'm going to delegate that. You know that's the right way to do it. So yes, I'm sure uh, I'm sure everyone who uh, has to uh, everybody who works with me is is very much aware that. That's where I come from, but I'm, I, you know, I'm. Not, I also don't hide it. What kind of technology have you worked on as a litigator? Just give me a feel for the kinds of technologies you've worked on. Sure. So semiconductor chip design is mm -hmm. is one that has come up. Networking. Um, we worked uh, in October. We had a trial based on wireless networking technology. Uh, a trial in San Diego that was a fascinating case. Mm -hmm. Probably, probably the most. Um, interesting and engrossing trial that I've been involved in was for our client Cenex, which was a, another um, Bay Area startup company. They were doing SSD technology, solid state drives. Yeah. And um, they had a, they, they had and have a very innovative uh, technology for the controller for a solid state drive. And they were sued for trade secret misappropriation by Huawei. Huawei is a huge multinational technology mm -hmm. uh, corporation. Mm -hmm. Um, and they accused our client of some horrible things of taking taking technology. Um, so for me, the the work of that case was, you know, really diving deep into how do these solid state drives work. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, that was something that I remember very specifically when I was a law student sitting in the law library and probably being faced with some, uh, you know, remedies case that was not the most exciting case in the world. And at the time, say 2006 or seven, I was poking around and SSD drives were becoming big news, right? They yeah, were the yeah, big yeah, thing yeah. and, and yeah, yeah. the old mechanical, electromechanical drives were, you know, showing their showing their age. Yeah. I'm sitting there researching SSD drives in the law library and I kind of scolded myself, like, what are you doing? You're yeah. a law student. You don't need to be researching the new technology and reading all about it. But, you know, it was probably eight years later, I was in a courtroom in Sherman, Texas litigating the exact type of technology that I'd been studying. And in fact, our whole theory of the case, which ultimately prevailed, was all these concepts that the other side said our client took, they were common knowledge. 
they were things that people already knew how to do in the industry. And if you dug in, if you read the papers, if you talked to, you know, professors and people who'd been in the industry, they say, yeah, everybody's known how to do that for a long time. And to, you know, gussy that up as trade secrets and specific, tech, you know, somebody specific innovations is really not correct. Hmm. So that that case was both gratifying in that one, and it was an exciting case, but also in that um, it, it kind of uh, led me to trust my instincts and to like, be interested in new technology, even if it's not technology that I'm litigating or working with a client on, like, you know, I have to keep it interesting, right? And and so learning about what's what's happening in the technology world is is something that never gets old for me. Very cool. What is the most complicated technology you've ever had to like learn or understand? Or was that it? Or was there anything that you've run across as a lawyer that you thought was like the hardest thing you've had to really try to under had to understand? Yeah, yeah. Good question. Um, Probably it's it's things that are outside my electrical specialty, mm-hmm. right? So, um, you know, when when things involve more chemical processes oh, yeah. uh-huh. or um, biological processes, I, I I barely even touch because uh, I, I just don't feel like that's my my bailiwick. And there are people who are so much yeah. better qualified yeah. to do it. Yeah. But you know, th- there's a phase of any of these patent cases or technology cases where often you're starting from zero. You're yeah. you're learning and you're having to you know, take what is a general awareness of a type of technology and figure out quickly, what are the key questions I need to be asking? Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, you, you it, I mean, it's, it's pretty evident you found a career that you love and it, you know, really dovetail, you know, it really culminates nicely with your educational background and your interests. Do you ever kind of reflect on how ironic that is or how you kind of stumbled into that or, you know, kind of reflect on that? Yeah, for sure. For it? sure. I, I, I used to say... Um, both when I was in college and, and when I was applying to law school, you know, in my either in my late teenage years or in my in my 20s, you're at that point in your life, you're making these consequential decisions, kind of laying these big timbers for your future. And you don't have a lot to go on. It's kind yeah, of like, yeah. I enjoy this or this seems interesting. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, it's kind of a it, it's a rewarding thing to um, follow those instincts and follow through with them and then you know, find something that really is rewarding in the long term. Totally. Well, Dan, I really appreciate your sharing story. You know, I've interviewed lots and lots of lawyers and I can always tell when when someone really loves what they do and that was totally evident today. So I really appreciate your taking the time to share the story with me. Thank you. Well, it's it's been a pleasure and uh, thank you so much for having me. This is Richard Shu and Dan Calloway. Thanks. <laughs>